Okay, so this is chapter 12, and let's see. And so we're going to be talking about cholinergic drugs affecting the autonomic nervous system. Um, and then chapter 13, I think, is going to be, uh, where this is cholinergic, like acetylcholine, uh, chapter 13 is going to be norepinephrine. And so we're going to take on, and I don't want you to get too hung up on it, but uh, the peripheral nervous system versus the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So we're going to kind of do some reviews, but like I said, you guys know this stuff, um, and so I, I don't want you to uh, sort of panic. Like when you see this, think, oh gosh, I have to know this whole, you know, tree of the nervous system. You don't. That ship has sailed. Um, all, all this is kind of a reminder because we see nervous systems, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, all this stuff that you've learned before. Um, but now we're down here with the autonomic nervous system, and I'm, I'm not, I don't care if you know in what order and all that other stuff, I, I have to rethink about it every time too. But one thing you do need to know is that the autonomic nervous system, and I think you do know this, is made up of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. And the sympathetic division is going to be the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic division is going to be the rest and digest. And now we care about since we're talking about drug effects, we care about the adrenaline or adrenergic receptors versus acetylcholine or cholinergic re receptors. Now, cholinergic acetylcholine, when you release acetylcholine, it slows the heart down, okay, from the, from the vagus nerve. Uh, that's parasympathetic activation. Acetylcholine is the, is the neurotransmitter um, that's released to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and it's released onto what we call cholinergic receptors. Now we're also going to talk later about uh, how uh, um, uh, norepinephrine is released in the sympathetic division and it's released onto adrenergic receptors and those are you know further alpha beta we'll talk about that later. Uh, cholinergic receptors we have here muscarinic now there's also nicotinic but remember nicotinic were what we saw at the neuromuscular junction and we also see them in the preganglionic. Now we're going to talk about those things, but again, I hope you don't get uh, too too hung up on it because we're really interested in the effects of these drugs. Uh, it just helps to kind of review everything about why they're categorized and classified the way that they are. Okay, so uh, autonomic nervous system, yes, sympathetic nervous system activated under stress, fight or flight response, readies the body for an immediate response to a potential threat. Okay. Um, Parasympathetic, activated under non-stressful conditions, rest and digest, digestive process is promoted, heart rate and blood, blood pressure decline, okay? Hopefully we all know that. So um, the branches, so you have something called uh, autonomic tone. So, so you always have a little bit of the sympathetic activated, a little bit of the parasympathetic activated, and kind of, you know, it kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes a little more sympathetic, a little more parasympathetic, whatever, whatever happens to be going on. Um, and they mostly uh, have opposite effects, but not always, okay? So we're going to see some things like sweat glands only controlled by sympathetic nerves, uh, vasoconstriction, um, and then vasodilation is only controlled by the symp by sympathetic activity, uh, norepinephrine, that kind of that kind of thing. Uh, but overall, when you have activation of the sympathetic, uh, you're more activation of the sympathetic. You're going to have less activation of the parasympathetic. Okay. All right. So homeostasis is a proper balance of the two branches achieved by changing one or both branches. So decreased activity of one branch allows the other branch to be more uh, expressed. Okay. Um, so this is from your book, and remember, 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 from Patho, and before that, maybe, um, how the parasympathetic is mainly cranial sacral, okay? So it's mainly up here, that it's activated and down here, okay? But yet, it still activates lots of these. So we, we worried about that when we were talking about uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, so this is kind of there still. So, um, but you can see activation of the eye and it kind of lists down here everything that uh, the parasympathetic does versus the sympathetic. And you can see that it's pretty much the opposite. So parasympathetic constricts the pupil, sympathetic dilates the pupil, and then you see down here uh, parasympathetic contracts the bladder. Remember rest and digest means that you're going to urinate and then sympathetic relaxes the bladder so it can fill, okay? Um, 
Why do we care about that? Because, well, because drugs that uh, were, were some of these drugs, these cholinergic drugs that activate this parasympathetic or don't block it, uh, are going to have an effect on uh, incontinence or uh, overactive bladder kind of, kind of issues. All right. Um, Okay, so you can kind of look through those. Shouldn't be anything too unpredictable about that. All right, so synaptic transmission. Yes, the synapse is a junction of neurons. Connection of two neurons outside the CNS ganglionic synapse. This, we call it ganglionic synapse outside. I don't, don't even worry about that. However, we're going to see these things called preganglionic and postganglionic. And that just means that, you know, coming from the spinal cord, and then you have a synapse here, and then, or I guess it would be shaped like that, and then there's a, synapse here and then and then you know and then you have your organ okay so so preganglionic postganglionic that's what we're talking about and I have better pictures than that so many drugs affect autonomic function by altering neurotransmitter activity at the second synapse but all that's saying is that these drugs that we're talking about have their effect here not here okay because these are all nicotinic and that'll make more sense in a second I hope okay this is where you have your what are called muscarinic or you have norepinephrine, but we're not talking about norepinephrine right now. We'll talk about that the next slide or the next chapter. All right. So um, primary neurotransmitter acetylcholine. <coughs> so um, that's this chapter. Still talking about um, autonomic, but we're interested in parasympathetic. So that's why this is in purple, and this one's just left uh, normal because we're not talking about this one yet, even though it's it's uh, going to be important later. So acetylcholine neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. So there are two types of receptors, the nicotinic receptors, okay, so this is your spinal cord, the nicotinic receptors, which are these guys, the first ones. And then where this is released onto the organ, those are muscarinic. Okay. So that's why that's why we care. Um, because both of these can be activated by acetylcholine. So think about that. Both of these can be activated by acetylcholine, um, but this is where it's different, okay? And between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. I, if I've lost you, don't worry, we have a picture coming up. So name this because nicotine binds to these receptors. Um, and they're also located at the uh, so preganglionic and both sympathetic and parasympathetic, but they're also located in skeletal muscles. So when we were activating these muscles, okay, um, that those were nicotinic receptors that we were that, that acetylcholine was binding to. So um, we'll we'll also come back and kind of hint around to that later. So. Hopefully this will all make sense. So muscarinic receptors, name this because this chemical called muscarin, or this drug or compound called muscarin from poisonous mushrooms binds to them. Nicotine binds to these. They're both re acetylcholine receptors, so acetylcholine binds to both of them. But, uh, and if you think about drugs, then we have a little powerful weapon there. We can say, oh, we're gonna make a drug that binds to this one but not to this one. So one that binds to the muscarinic, but not to the nicotinic, okay? And that's exactly what this chapter is pretty much about. So name this because muscarin from poisons, yes. Uh, located in the parasympathetic target organs, we'll see a picture. And response stimulates smooth muscle, stimulates gland secretion. So this is mainly when we're talking about digestive motility, uh, smooth muscle. So it's going to, yes, increase motility because this is your parasympathetic. The muscarinic receptors are, are associated with only and exclusively pretty much the um, parasympathetic response. Okay. So gland and smooth muscle of the digestive system and other places. So in the heart, it decreases heart rate and the force of contraction. Very important. That's uh, if you're treating somebody with one of these, you might want to watch the blood pressure okay, or watch for bradycardia. All right. So um, this is what, so here's our spinal cord. Again, try not to get too hung up. Just look at it. Here's the spinal cord. And then there's this thing we call a ganglion where it's just a synapse. And that's where nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are okay okay so it releases acetylcholine and then activates the next one and then um, and then that's next to the target tissue so for 
parasympathetic. So for parasympathetic activation, yeah, acetylcholine release, nicotinic. Um, then you have colon or muscarinic receptors over there okay, at the organ. So that's where our drug target is going to be. So our good drug is going to either block muscarinic receptors or activate muscarinic receptors because we don't want it to have an effect over here. We want it to have its effect here at the organ. Okay, so a sympathetic pathway, and this is why we want the specificity because this is also nicotinic. So, I mean, you, you're not separating parasympathetic and sympathetic if you're just activating nicotinic. Um, but in the sympathetic, it's norepinephrine, so completely different. Okay, so we can, bottom line, we can decide if we are going to activate or block sympathetic or parasympathetic signals exclusively. Okay, because we can either, we can have drugs that are specific to this, this is this chapter, this muscarinic receptor. Okay, all right. So, um, so this is kind of, you know, showing the same thing with the, with the double preganglionic, postganglionic, not too worried about it. And all I'm saying is that we care about the neurotransmitter that is released, like here, lacrimal gland, so, um, tears and then the eye, uh, nasal areas or olfaction, and, uh, you know, on, on down the line. Okay, so we're interested in what's released onto the onto the organ, and right now we're only really interested in the, uh, the parasympathetic side. Okay, so cholinergic and adrenergic drugs work primarily on the postganglionic ne neurons at the target organ. Okay, so one more thing just to make things complicated, uh, but also to clarify, you're going to see a lot of these muscarinic activators, and then. You're thinking, okay, and muscarinic, active, uh, muscarinic receptors are pretty much on every organ. They're all over the place. So how can we have an effect on the heart, but not on the lungs, or on the eye, or but not the bladder, or the bladder, but not the heart? That kind of thing. And it's because, in addition to being both muscarinic and nicotinic, the muscarinic are also divided, and there are a whole bunch of them. Usually we talk about three, M1, M2, M3, but there's also M4, M5. Okay, so, um, so like if we want to activate, and there are drugs, it's really cool, there are drugs that will only, and the receptors are just shaped a little different, that's it, uh, a little bit different amino acid sequence, which makes it respond differently, and it's found in different parts of the body. So we have drugs that will activate only this one, or pretty much only that one, and then it will only have an effect on the heart, or um, M3, it may only have an effect on the uh, digestive system and, uh, and, the, and the bladder or something like that, okay? So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you say, okay, how can you have a drug that's just specific to the bladder and not everything? And it's because some of these drugs are very specific to the particular subclass of these muscarinic receptors. Okay, and a lot of them will be labeled that way. It'll be like an M3 agonist or something like that. All right, so several mechanisms by which cholinergic drugs may act. Acetylcholine is released by the presynaptic neuron and binds receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so after acetylcholine, I hope we understand that. It's released here and it binds to the receptor. And there are a couple of different receptors there. Uh, after acetylcholine is released, it's quickly broken down by acetylcholinesterase. Yeah, so acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So we have, so far, three, it says several mechanisms by which cholinergic drugs may act. We have three that I can think of just right offhand. We can give a drug, so we're going to have this as our drug. We can give a drug, and when it moves into the body, it may activate that directly, okay? Direct activator, agonist. It's just going to activate it, and it doesn't matter whether acetylcholine is there or not. It's activating. Okay, that's one way. Or we could have a, uh, it could inactivate it, okay? So it could block it. So cholinergic blocker. So, so we block that. And then that's going to have you know, less of an effect. It's going to decrease the uh, parasympathetic response. Okay, so that's two. We could either block it or we could activate the receptor. The other thing is the acetylcholinesterase, the acetylcholinesterase, the thing that's breaking it down. Um, it, 
So when the acetylcholine is released, it binds to the receptor and it bounces off and it binds and it bounces off and ultimately gets chewed up by acetylcholinesterase, this enzyme. Okay, so these guys all just kind of kind of go away after a while. Now, if we block acetylcholinesterase, essentially what we're doing is we're leaving that acetylcholine in the in the synapse longer. Okay, so even though we're not directly activating the receptor like we were talking about with a direct activator, we're kind of indirectly activating it, aren't we? Because we're leaving more acetylcholine there, which is going to cause more activity. That's lightning. Okay. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that makes that makes sense because that's how we're going to categorize these. And the three drugs, the, the three prototype drugs that your book covers, that's that's kind of how they they draw the lines. Okay. So classification and naming of autonomic drugs based on two possible actions affecting the parasympathetic nervous system. Stimulation of parasympathetic nervous system. Stimulation. I don't think I put my emphasis on the right syllables. Stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. That is what. Okay. That's one way to classify and name autonomic drugs. So we stim stimulate it, so we're going to call those parasympathomimetics, so it's mimicking the parasympathetic response, um, or cholinergic agents. This one, however, as we just learned, is really kind of divided into two classes, two subclasses. Direct acting, that's where we were like, yeah, let's just give a drug that activates the receptor. Boom, done. You know, you have your response. And then indirect acting, say, oh, let's give a drug that blocks acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme breaking it down, which leaves it in the system longer. Still more activity. So there's the same kind of effect. They're both mimicking parasympathetic responses, but they're just working in different ways. One of them is direct binds the receptor, the other is indirect, and eh, it gets rid of the enzyme that's breaking down the natural acetylcholine. Okay, now high potential for serious adverse effects because we saw earlier, or we mentioned earlier, that muscle, skeletal muscle is also activated by acetylcholine. Okay, so if we're directly activating a muscarinic, those are going to be off in the organs. It's nicotinic receptors that are at your, at your skeletal muscle. So, so you shouldn't have activation of skeletal muscle if you're using a muscarinic agonist. However, acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme that breaks it down, is in lots of places. So it can have effects that can be a good thing or it can, it can cause adverse effects, which can be bad. All right, and then the other one hopefully makes sense, inhibition of parasympathetic nervous system. So that's going to be where your receptor is here and you're just going to block the receptor, okay? So you're just going to give a give a compound, a chemical that sits right there at the receptor site and doesn't let your acetylcholine activate your parasympathetic. So we're going to call that a an anticholinergic or a parasympatholytic. So lytic means to lice or to cut, or in this case to to block or cut off the uh, sympathetic or parasympathetic response, which is going to look like, I guess if you want to talk about like pharmacodynamics, which is going to look like activation of the sympathetic nervous system uh, because you blocked the parasympathetic response. Okay, so so the drugs, uh, cholinergic drugs. So these are drugs that are going to uh, be parasympathomimetic, so they're going to cause activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, so this is your category here, direct acting, okay? Direct acting, and then the, uh, the prototype drug that your book lists is, is uh, pathenicol, col, so uric uricholine, and it's got this nice ura in there for, for the name, the cute name. Uh, stimulates urine and it's for also treatment of dry mouth, but it's a, it can stimulate urine, stimulate urination, okay? Uh, Botanical. And then, so that's direct acting, so we remember that, which means it is a muscarinic receptor agonist. It's activating it directly. Uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, or acetylcholinesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, indirect inhibitors of the enzyme, the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, okay? And there are some of these, and your uh, prototype drug here is physostigmine. And that's labeled 
are listed here for treatment of severe anticholinergic toxicity. So that means if somebody gives you an anticholinergic, this will increase your the amount of uh, acetylcholine you have because it blocks the enzyme and it leaves that acetylcholine in there longer. Uh, but there are a couple of others. Now, I, I, I want you to understand this. Uh, neostigmine is listed here for myasthenia gravis, uh, peridostigmine also for myasthenia gravis. And we understand, right, why these are listed for myasthenia gravis. Okay? Because if we have activation by a motor neuron, and remember what these are doing, they're indirect, um, they're indirect acting. Okay, so they, they inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, which leaves acetylcholine in the synapse longer. They don't care. Remember that. These guys, these indirect uh, acting drugs, don't care whether it's a muscarinic receptor or whether it's a nicotinic receptor. And remember, at muscles, it's nicotinic. These guys will activate it no matter what. Okay, so... Um, so that's why it's used for myasthenia gravis. Remember, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder where your acetylcholine receptors are being um, are being uh, eliminated. So it's, a, it's autoimmune, so your immune system is taking them out. And so this is going to block acetylcholinesterase, leave acetylcholine in the system longer, and, uh, and cause an increase in effect. Okay, so it's the same category. And I, I, guess, I guess I make a big deal about this because uh, these these drugs that we're going to look at may not be the most may not be the most common uh, and they may not be the most useful I mean physostigmine that's great treatment of severe anticholinergic toxicity and yet there are drugs out there that are being used that fall into these same classes that um, that are uh, pretty important okay so um, so parasympathomimetic okay so that's the general category we're talking about so the first prototype drug is bethanicol uh, and its mechanism of action to activate the parasympathetic nervous system directly. So in this case, it's directly. Uh, I think this mechanism that's listed here is just sort of a general mechanism for all parasympathomimetics. And uh, so directly, uh, but it can also be indirectly, but that would be the ACHE inhibitors. And that's not what we're talking about right now uh, if we're refocusing on this prototype drug. Uh, induce rest and digest response, and uh, yes, that's what we're doing. So the use for this drug, the bethanicol, non-obstructive urinary retention. Increases motility of the digestive tract, uh, stimulates smooth muscle contraction. Okay. That's, that's what we want to do, it's, uh, and therefore it's mimicking the parasympathetic nervous system, because the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system is what causes urinary or uh, bladder empty. Okay, so adverse effects, and these are going to be things that are related to parasympathetic actions. Profuse salivation, sweating, abdominal cramping, uh, urinary frequency might increase, bradycardia, hypo, hypotension, right? Because uh, it's uh, acetylcholine slows the heart and it's going to cause it to be, so bradycardia and then uh, hypotension, uh, lower blood pressure. Okay, so here we go, uh, bethanicol, non-obstructive urinary retention drug and uh, so you can kind of go through so it's kind of everything most of what we most of what we just said um, let's see uh, drug to drug I, I mean that's something to point out you wouldn't want to use you have to you have to consider that if you use something that is a direct acting okay so it's directly hitting those uh, parasympathetic or the uh, muscarinic receptors, then it can, if you have a cholinesterase inhibitor also on top of that, that can really add to the, add to the effect as well. Okay, um, so hopefully that makes sense. Those two will, will compound on each other, okay, because they are different mechanisms and that's what we're talking about. This is the mechanism we're talking about for this one. Okay, so um, so here is, um, this is, so, okay, so going back real quick here. So bethanicol was a direct acting, okay? It's direct acting, direct acting right there. Direct acting. That means it activates the receptor. Um, 
physostigmine, or antlerium, inhibits acetylcholinesterase, which makes it indirect acting. Okay, so it's not actually activating the muscarinic receptor, it's blocking acetylcholinesterase, reverses, reviewers like Paul Revere, reverses, that's supposed to say reverses, toxic and life-threatening delirium caused by anticholinergic agents. So reverses the toxic and so that's the that's the list, that's the way this drug is listed. But as I said, it does other things, and wow, this is spelled wrong twice. So oh, because it's a cut and paste, interesting. Um so bradycardia, asystole, I didn't make all these, I made some of them. So bradycardia, asystole, restlessness, nervousness, seizures. So we're looking at things that are um, that are kind of, um, we have more adverse effects. Remember that, we have more adverse effects with the indirect acting because these are also, these are working on all acetylcholine not just the muscarinic. So it's also working like at the neuromuscular junction. So restlessness, nervousness, seizures, uh, salivation, which are uh, parasympathetic, urinary frequency, yeah. Muscle twitching, again, that's because these also can have an effect at the neuromuscular junction. And respiratory paralysis, same thing. Okay, so, so this is uh, your list for this, antidote for anticholinergic toxicity. Okay. So some things to remember, um, and and I want to I want to make it yeah, okay. So uh, some things to remember: if you're increasing acetylcholinest or acetylcholine activity or parasympathetic activity, then you can form something or something can develop called cholinergic crisis, uh, which is essentially when you have too much activation of uh, the parasympathetic or acetylcholine uh, pathway. So Cholinergic crisis, and these are these things. Hopefully, as you go through them, make sense. Hypersalivation, yeah, because parasympathetic activity causes increased salivation. Small pupils, right, because parasympathetic sympathetic is large dilation. Um, muscle twitching because of activity of the skeletal muscle. Unusual paleness, sweating, muscle weakness um, can happen. Uh, difficulty breathing, so uh, so same thing. Uh, muscle weakness can happen because you have uh, activation of both inhibitory and uh, excitatory. And so another thing to do, so this is a cholinergic crisis. There's also uh, anticholinergic crisis that we'll talk about in a minute. So monitor liver enzymes. These are broken down in the liver, so it's always good to, to do that. Calculate and monitor doses. Yes, of course. Assess and monitor for appropriate self-care administration. Okay. Uh, so direct acting, and this is where we again not to not to beat it too much, but uh, direct acting monitor intake and output ratio. So we have these as uh, things to watch for: input output, blurred vision because of the effects it has on the uh, on the eyes, um, orthostatic hypotension because it drops blood pressure. The indirect acting or the cholinesterase inhibitors have more more things to watch for because of that involvement of the skeletal muscle. So monitor muscle strength, neuromuscular status, uh, ptosis, di diplopia, uh, which is an early indicator eye muscle weakness. So this is like, I believe, um, when your eyes start to droop or cross, you, you sort of you sort of lose strength to, I guess, hold up your, your eyelids. It's one of the first places that this can be noticed. Uh, Schedule medication around meal time. Schedule activities to avoid fatigue and monitor for uh, muscle weakness. Okay. All right, so cholinergic blocking drugs, drugs that. So this is the the final category. So we had the uh, the uh, cholinergic that were parasympathomimetic, and now we have that was divided into direct and indirect, and now we have cholinergic blocking drugs. So drugs that inhibit parasympathetic impulses. So this is going to look like sympathetic activation. Uh, suppression of parasympathetic division induces the fight or flight symptoms. Uses are predictable extension of parasympathetic blocking effects. Right, so uh, you're going to see sympathetic types of things. So effect can include pupil dilation, uh, mydriasis, which is what that's called, uh, increasing heart rate, yeah, and drying glandular secretions, yeah, uh, relaxing bronchi, so so the things that you wouldn't see with parasympathetic activity or the decrease in parasympathetic activity is when you do see them. 
So uses include peptic ulcer disease, ophthalmic pr procedures. I think we've talked a lot about uh, the, uh, the effects they have on uh, dilation and uh, the cilia, the cilia in your eye that uh, kind of, or the cilia, the um, the lens to to help you focus, those kinds of things. Uh, anesthesia and adjunct, so um, these can, if you're blocking, if you're blocking acetylcholine receptors, then that can cause a decrease of a response overall and maybe, uh, maybe cut down on some uh, reflex types of responses. Asthma, COPD is another overactive bladder. That makes sense because earlier we had, we were trying to activate the bladder and now we want to remove that activation, that parasympathetic activation. We want to remove that by blocking it and that's going to uh, uh, reduce urination. Okay, so uh, cholinergic drugs. Uh, so we're still talking about that actually. So cholinergic blocking drugs or anticholinergics. The one prototype that we're covering here is atropine. And it's not really, uh, you know, atropine was the first one I learned about. And I only really anymore, I only see it in research. Uh, I mean, it's important because it does, it blocks um, uh, acetylcholine receptors. And um, so I guess I guess it, it is important and it's very very well known. Uh, so atropine or atropen is the is the trade name. So poisoning with anticholinesterase agents to increase heart rate, dilate pupils. Okay, so that 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 is important. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but what what it makes me think of is that there are so many other uh, drugs where um, just just like I, I mentioned with the uh, with the uh, the agonists. Wait. This is cholinergic. Oh, okay, cholinergic. But we are talking about anticholinergic. But with the agonist, the uh, muscarinic agonist, um, there are other activities besides just that, just that uh, prototype drug. And I know that kind of makes you nervous uh, because there are so many. But but there are certain certain drugs that I'm pointing out uh, that are probably good to remember. And remember, they all have the same basic effect. But um, but they're uh, but they're just just with uh, with different names, probably different receptor uh, specificity. So here's oxybutynin, uh, which is incontinence, and you can see a lot of these. Um, let's see, scopolamine is another one. I wouldn't have minded highlighting that one. Scopolamine, motion sickness, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, a lot of these are for overactive bladder. Okay, and here's one for. Parkinson's disease, another overactive bladder. And so, um, yeah, so irritable bowel syndrome kind of makes sense because if you're blocking uh, acetylcholine, then that you're going to block uh, motility, you're going to block uh, GI activity, uh, depending on dose and how much you want to block it, okay? So, so look those over, especially the ones I talked about. Um, and then maybe some of them we talk about in class, uh, be, be a little more uh, aware of those. All right, so cholinergic bro blocking agents, prototype drug, atropine, yes, that's what we're talking about, atropair, atropizole, atropazole, sorry. Uh, mechanism of action to inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system. Primary use depends on the drugs, uh, but there are lots. Peptic ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, adriasis, uh, cycloplegia during eye examination, dilates pupil, prevents focusing, um, which is what these do individually. Uh, bradycardia, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's going to speed up the heart because it's blocking the parasympathetic uh, signal. Pre-anesthetic, asthma, adverse effects, yeah, everything that you would see with uh, a sympathetic type of response. Tachycardia, CNS stimulation, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, dry eyes, decreased sweating, Photophobia because of the uh, because of the eye effects. Okay, so here's atropine. Uh, so you can look through this again. It's listed, labeled here for antidote for anticholinesterase poisoning. Yeah, um, that can be important sometimes, but uh, don't forget about those other other little guys and some of the other effects. Okay, and it blocks muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, all right, so. 
Real quick, roll the nurse anticholinergic monitor for signs of anticholinergic crisis. So these are the same types of things. Hot as Hades, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter. I don't know what a hatter is. I should probably have looked that up at some point in my childhood. But um, but they're mad. And by mad, we mean confusion. Okay, So like the British version of mad. So hot as Hades, increased temp, decreased sweating. So these are kind of sympathetic types of sympathetic expression uh, that's going on here because you're blocking the parasympathetic. Dry as a bone, decreased secretions, thirsty, blind as a bat. Remember the vision problems because there are a lot of, there's a lot of activity, whether it's focusing, uh, pupil constriction, um, your eyelids even we talked about. Okay, and mad as a hatter. So uh, there are CNS uh, effects. Uh, acetylcholine is, a, uh, is an important neurotransmitter in the brain too. Okay, so report changes in heart rate, blood pressure, or development of dysrhythmias. Provide comfort measures for dry mouth, yeah. Minimize exposure to heat or cold or strenuous exercise. And um, some people want to live anyway. Uh, monitor intake and output, yeah. Okay, because we're talking about, you know, urinary. Uh, monitor patient for abnormal distension and oscillate for bowel sounds. Okay, and I think that's it for this chapter. So these are your nursing practice applications, which you can read through those and understand them very, very well all by yourself. And thank you and have a nice day. Night.